from Cat. The brand used by professionals. $150 camera, um, microphone. All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Hey, welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. It is so nice to be here with you. I'm going to talk about Hong Kong, Puerto Rico, Boris Johnson. Lots of things happening overseas, and we may touch on uh, the debates, which are happening tonight. Even though this is this, we're recording this on Tuesday, July thirtieth, uh, but most of you will hear it on Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, but so we won't we won't go too in depth on debates that aren't going to happen, but you'll know the result of by the time you hear this. So, uh, with me is Harry Price, as always, and uh, we will be right back after this disclaimer. Warning: This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive. <laughs> Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Hey, everybody. That's me. It's so nice to be here. Uh, it is... Stop that right there. Let's, let's get on with the, uh, the show. Well, I have to stop it because, Harry, Harry, how are you? I'm going good. Going good. In my remote location. So you are in a remote good. location. Uh, you have the... The text that I got from Harry was, I'm not coming to your effing cold house, you effing monster. I refuse until you turn it up above 68 degrees. And I said no, and so he threw a tantrum and stayed home. Is that true? Yes, completely, 100% true, even though it took me a while to get the basement over 68, but yeah. All right, well, you missed out because our one of our best listeners, one of our best friends who is either still on or just back from an overseas trip, Jason Doolittle, uh, sent you a lovely fleece blanket. And he says, tell Harry that I hope he stays warm in your apartment. And so you have dishonored Jason by not showing up tonight. Oh, no. I think you owe him a public apology. I think uh, Chris owes uh, me the public apology for keeping the uh, studio too cold. Um, it's uh, sexist and racist to have the temperature that cold. How is it racist? Um, black people are tropical people. You know this. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, turn your mic up just a smidge, actually. So we've, we've not done it this way where Harry's been in a remote location before. Uh, we wanted to give it a shot. I had uh, an appointment on the north side, and I didn't know if I'd be back on time. And, I, and he threw out the brilliant idea of let's you – sent, you gave me that mic. Let's, let's do it remotely and see how this goes. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. It's weird not having you here, but it's actually kind of nice because my apartment doesn't smell like coffee, and I haven't heard you bitching for the last half hour. I thought about just sending you like texts just so you get that feel still, you know, like that, that I'm there, that I'm always like there, you know. Right. Just, yeah, I was like just complaining about other stuff, Wi Fi speeds at my own house, but act like I'm there at yours. But uh, <laughs> it, it is nice, but like, but it's also because Indianapolis has, I don't know who's doing the road construction planning, but they're drunk. They have no it's awful. And literally every single road in this state is under construction right now. Yeah. And in the city, it's even worse. In the biggest city, 25% of the population of money in the state. Mm -hmm. And we have a, basically like a loop around it called 465. Mm -hmm. And it's every – they're just closing it down constantly. Right. I mean, it's impossible to drive around the city right now. Yes. Uh, and then we've got Gen Con. This is Gen Con week. And we've got like, what, 65,000 people coming in from the airport and just coming down to downtown Indianapolis and I-70 from the airport into downtown is closed. 75,000 attendees to Gen Con and 25,000 sticks of deodorant. Yeah. <laughs> That's a gross um, high number for uh, sticks of deodorant. Yeah. If yeah. you've never smelled a Gen Con, 
is brutal. Yeah. It's that different type of nerd. It's and all the and all, the deodorant sticks are from the cosplayers, okay? Right. The gamers. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's the people who are comfortable playing sixty three hours straight of a game and never showering. Like it it really they really literally I'm not kidding you. They had they put up signs at Gen Con don't they like close it down at one point like you can only play 12 straight hours and then they send you home or they like yeah they air it out they make you they force you to go home but they'll still play they'll go outside of the halls and they'll play games in the hall and um, that's not a diss like i've been hardcore and played like that i have taken breaks to go shower don't get me wrong i'm not gonna just sit there and game i've wanted to just sit there and keep gaming but you know stank is stank it is. It's board games too. It's like hardcore, like Settlers of Catan, but super elaborate and cutthroat. And yes, and it's just it's their lives, and they've got nothing going on, and no deodorant. It's brutal. I well, went, it, yeah, it, I went and I just, I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't care for it. It, it, it is for the gamer. A lot of people expect Gen Con is like, well, this is like San Diego Comic Con. No. No, it's this is gaming. It's it's a bunch of nerds here, but this is like this is for gaming nerds. And well, I, now that we've lost half our audience, <laughs> half our audience is sitting there going, ah, "Excuse me, sir." <laughs> like yeah. Politics and debate, but no, I want to get like the, Gen Con is a great convention. Come, come to Gen Con if you're into any type of board gaming, you life gaming. Come, the video game section of Gen Con is growing. It's still small. But the Magic the Gathering is huge. All the trading card games are huge. The um, to come just for a true dungeon event. And if you're a D and D gamer, if you've never done or heard a true dungeon, it is an amazing thing to like to be able to sit there and actually be in the dungeon and have that feel for. It. It's hard to get in, but it is a lot. It is a blast. Um, just coming in and playing games and characters. I was once in a five year. LARP story that continued over five different gen card LARPs. The story is actually still going on and actually uh, found out like a character I had in a LARP, you know, accident like uh, got killed uh, <laughs> two stories ago. But I said, you know, but the SD is like, you know, you just didn't show up. So we didn't, we just wrote your character off. But if you come back in, we can like surprise you. Harry, Harry committed LARPing suicide. His <laughs> wife. <laughs> so live action role playing Harry was playing he's like I can't take it anymore I don't know if you that if your uh, mic or whatever has like an automatic processing sort of thing but you'll be talking and it'll be normal and then it'll go oh, like this so I don't know if there's some sort of thing that you can turn off but uh, that I could check. much appreciated if you can look into that uh, I actually went to the great white menace of the north for the very first time this past weekend Harry Mm. Um, I am. I do another podcast now. It's a comedy podcast called The Pat Down with comedian Miss Pat, who is one of the funniest humans on earth. You will soon hear her name. Uh, one of the best books I've ever read is Rabbit, her autobiography. And uh, Dion Curry is uh, also a co-host. And the three of us went up to the Just for Last Festival, which is like the, the biggest, at least in North America, maybe in the world, the biggest comedy festival. And it's super prestigious in the comedy community. I was not aware of what a big deal it was until I was on the plane heading to it, and several friends were like, "Do you even understand where you're?" I'm like, "No, I have no frame of reference, you know." And I, I didn't get it till the ride home when the kid was like, "I was in the airport, and this kid's like, my dream is to perform at the Just for Last festival." So, you never, uh, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. I guess you really need context in life to appreciate where you're at. Um, but I had a great time. I. I uh, really enjoyed li – uh, we did a live podcast, and Howie Mandel was our first guest, and uh, he was hilarious. Really go check out the Pat Down if you're not listening to it. Please support me. Uh, if you like this show, if you like me, if you hate me, I don't blame you. Uh, then you don't have to listen to that podcast, but you'll you'll probably like Miss Pat a lot better than me. Um, now uh, – I'm sorry. I just wanted to know how Howie Mandel and Miss Pat got along. This, is, this sounds awesome. So uh, – <laughs> Howie was in an elevator and Miss Pat just started re Howie, I got my nipple shot off and I shot my ex-husband in the back of the head and I got four crack babies and this is my daughter, she's gay and this is her husband Mike <laughs> and he came to the taping and we talked to him and uh, he was super nice, he came up on the show and what we didn't know, or at least I didn't know, he owns the festival. And so he was there having a great time, and hopefully we'll get to go back and, like, do it on a bigger, like, even a bigger scope. So it was really cool. It was really, like, 
I don't know. It's really weird to just be on a stage doing a podcast with Howie Mandel. <laughs> you look over and there's Howie. I'm used to looking over and there's Reinhold. <laughs> that, wow. You, like, you're, so you were just kind of sitting on the stage just like, is this where I am? Huh. No, this, uh, time, yeah. this, this timeline's not so bad. <laughs> yeah. So turn your mic up a little bit, please. Oh, uh, yeah. I must yeah. have, whatever setting I hit, must have took it down. It, it 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 stopped the 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 issue, but yeah, uh, no. This whole Pat Dunn thing has been kind of surreal because Miss Pat is a major comedian with a lot of heat right now, mm -hmm. and she's like best friends with Joe Rogan, and so she went and did his podcast, and then flew me out with her to see. So I got to sit in the green room while she did the Rogan show, and like met him, shook his hand, took a picture. Super nice of her to take me. I did a bonus episode where you and I talked about my Rogan experience. So join the Patreon if you want to hear that. Um, and that was surreal. And then to like be doing a podcast at JFL with Howie Mandel, it's like, and then you look on the podcast charts and we're number 25 in comedy. And it was like number four at one point. We we're in the top 10 of all podcasts. And like see my name in, in the description of like a top 10 podcast is just very, I don't know. Part of it is really cool because, and I, I don't, I, I don't, I feel very odd, Harry, talking about this because I don't want to sound like I'm bragging. Uh, because trust me, in my head, good things are not supposed to happen to me. Uh, <laughs> but there is a little bit of weird, like, it's nice to have worked for 10 years on podcasting. And to get this kind, like, obviously people are going, they're booking Miss Pat, they're listening for Miss Pat. She's the special ingredient, but my expertise has kind of helped the show along, obviously, and and producing it, editing it, you know, all that jazz, you know. So my my experience has really kind of helped us get to where we are, and I I do have fun doing the show. Um, so it is a little weird to kind of get. Like to see your name at that, like, because that's not supposed to happen to you. Like, other other people's names are supposed to be in that like top twenty five, top ten podcast area and doing these cool things. So, I am like personally struggling with it a little bit because it's it's just not. I don't know. Like the the image in my head of where my career is and is supposed to be is different than kind of where she's taking me. So. Which I'm very, I'm greatly appreciative of, and I'm 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 having a blast doing it. But yeah, it it's odd. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you're putting in the work um, that you the same amount of work that you really do for Wall that you do for her. Um, yeah. Just you know, it's yeah, it's a it's a great ride that you're on. I I'm happy for you because, like I said, you put in your work. You know, podcasting inside it out. A lot of people just stumble into it and they kind of get you know, like lucky with equipment set up and stuff like that, but you actually know what, what you're doing when it comes to this stuff. It's, that's why I always find it we it's weird for me to talk technology with you, especially with podcasting, because this is your area of expertise. So when I'm like, what are you talking oh, Okay, I'll listen to you. Yeah, like what it, like I'm not gonna tell you about networking uh equipment. <laughs> Bo boost your mic a little more. We'll we'll get these settings right, I promise you. Teaching hospice, uh, teaching hospice. A little more, even more. A little more. Yep. Keep going. Harry, 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 keep testing, going. Testing one, two, chick a little, chick a little. All right, that that we'll just deal with that. That's jiggle, good. jiggle to the left. Perfect. Keep it there. Don't touch it. Don't don't move. <laughs> uh, What's just gonna happen? You're just gonna stop over, like turn my equipment on, and like just unplug it. Like this is the settings. Don't touch. <laughs> here, the here are the settings. It's me. I'm talking now. <laughs> takes the knobs. <laughs> it takes the knobs, or else it gets the hose again. I think maybe that piece of equipment to make is a for podcasters is a board or something to send to people that's just it does all the processing there, but you can digitally like control it like virtually. And that's got to be coming because I'll tell you what, like having I would love to do interviews and I, I love I'm very jealous of like when my see Mark Claire at the National Libertarian Convention and he knows everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's because Mark and Johnny like interview everybody and talk to them and like they're friendly with them. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't know them because my world is like you and our co-hosts and it's not talking to people that work for Liberty Fund or Cato or Mises or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and I do think that there are some really interesting conversations to be had in some of those one-on-one -on -one conversations. 
but the nightmare of doing an interview show is nothing I ever want to do. And you've seen it when we've had like guest hosts on where, you know, it's like, I, I love Rob Cortell, but like, it's when he and I, like I've sent him mics and headphones and all that. And like, it's just hard for, it's hard to get that set up right every time when you're doing it every six weeks. And so it'd be great to have that. Like if you could have that where you just plug this in and I can remote into this box I would ship that to every person that's doing an interview and then have them, you know, send a return label on it. I mean, it just, that's got to be the next frontier of, of podcasting. It really has to be because it's. We just, and uh, yeah, and if, if you've got the expertise to build this thing, build it. Yeah, we'll test it out. Yeah, send us the prototype, just build it. See, now you're all wild. This is, see, this is not going to work. Drive down here right now. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh let's get on with the big show uh let's start talking about some subjects we're not going to go terribly in depth i just wanted to um oh, oh i do want to say montreal is one of the worst places i've ever been in my life I, I i and it's not montreal it's me i don't know french and everything's in french and all the food was weird and it did and it looked like america but not mm. and i was frightened because it was different than what i'm used to and so I, I hated Montreal so much that I was glad to land in Philly. And when you're glad to be in Philly, then you know you've just come from a strange place. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, uh, well, it's thanks Canada. for contributing, Harry. That's Canada. Well, I think it's funny because, like, of Canada, everyone's got this, like, what they think Canada is. But no, yeah. Canada sucks. Canada is America's hat, and that's it. Attic. Uh, yes, America's Sorry, attic. attic. Where we keep the creepy French. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So we want to talk about Hong Kong and we want to talk about Puerto Rico and uh, maybe a little Boris and debates if we've got time. Um, but, uh, uh, Harry, there are major protests going on. Now, listen, I have long said I hate protests. I hate any American movement of protests or marches or sit-ins or rallies or any of that. It doesn't matter for what group or what cause. In America, they're ineffective, and they're just a, a total, like, it's just a, a way for groups that are attached to those identity politics to capture your information. They do nothing in the American body politic. And everybody, whenever I say that, everybody's like, oh, did you, did you look at the 60s? I'm like, yeah, and all of those people are almost dead. They were, that was 60, 70 years ago. G grow up. Mm -hmm. it's a different era now, boomer. <laughs> and... <laughs> And for whatever reason, protests just don't work uh, like they do in other areas of the world. Now, I think as we become more unstable, go watch episode nine of Ken Burns Vietnam and you'll see protests worked back then. But then, the, you know, like the soldiers throwing their medals onto the Capitol uh, mm -hmm. that they had won in Vietnam, the vets against Vietnam, like that was hugely powerful. And then in come the, the Antifa nonsense crazies who come in and uh, two days later just completely shut the city down and, and ruin that moment. Every movement's just full of lunatics. Right. Um, but there are some major protests. The biggest protest in the country is in Puerto Rico right now. Uh, so let's start with Puerto Rico because we're talking about American protest movements. But, uh, you know, there, there are – I'm trying to get to the page – Oh yeah, all the protests about the basically the, the from the the goings on of one the relief efforts in Puerto Rico and what was said on a social media site. Yeah, exactly. And the reason I wanted to talk about these with these great notes put together by Sam Schultz, uh, effectively our head researcher now, and just does an amazing job for us. I, I wanted to talk about them because I think we're about to. As I was on the plane watching that episode nine of Vietnam by Ken Burns, and you see like the social decay happening in American society in the late 60s, early 70s, I think that's where we're headed. Uh, I, I think we're headed to a time when there's going to be unrest and upset, and it'll, it'll look a lot like the late 60s. I think we're kind of like 1964 right now. Um, and... I think this is a bit of a preview of what, where we're headed here in America. Uh, and obviously Puerto Rico is America or part of it. And so we should pay attention to what's happening there and then as well as Hong Kong. So, yeah, the, the governor of Puerto Rico, Ricardo Rosello, 
He is actually the son of a former. He grew up in the mansion where the governor of Puerto Rico stays. And so he's a second generation politician and very good looking guy, very educated. I think he went to MIT. He's like a math whiz, engineer whiz. Uh, he went to Michigan, the University of Michigan, and just a really, really intelligent guy. And, and uh, Rosello like, became wealthy independently because um, uh, of, of that work, I think. And he, he has sort of a mixed background. His business efforts have kind of fallen through and fallen flat. Um, now, Harry, with you being out of the studio, I can't look at you and see when you want to talk. So you're just going to have to, like, speak up, okay? Okay, that's fine. So that's while I give the facts, if you want to give some analysis, then just uh, just pop your head up, okay? So over the last month, the last couple weeks specifically, um, the last 20 days, hundreds of thousands of people have been in Puerto Rico trying to take down Governor Rosello, Ricardo Rosello. So long story short, there was a texting scandal on Telegram where he and his boys and Harry, how long have we said, God forbid the wall chat ever gets made public. Oh yeah. Constantly. Yeah. That chat is, yeah, it's yeah. Not it's, what it used to be. That's for what sure. It used to be. And I always get worried when uh, people invite new people and we didn't vote them in. Yeah, I know. Like Paul, I know. I agree. He should be. Kicked I, I like these new people, but we should really vote. I know. We should let in. And but everybody, people. everybody has that group chat amongst their friends where you're like, Man, nobody ever sees this shit. Correct, correct. It's the one thing like um, at at work, I try to warn people like, listen, you 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 guys all know that these work chats are, you know, I see them all. What do you mean? They're private. Mm, no, no, no. And you use the n word too much. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you're on somebody else's network they can look at you right well the th correct yeah if you're using someone else's stuff yeah they can see that like just uh it's it's funny because how s people will type stuff into slack and they think like well it's it's just slack it's private i'm like yeah until you want to see it <laughs> <laughs> and then like the you know the person who owns the slack channel they just need to get permission from slack to see it that's it and you can see everything, and you will find out that Slack keeps everything. So Governor Rosello and his boys were in a group chat, and these boys are kind of – so basically he came in, a younger generation. Uh, I think he's a millennial, and he brought in a bunch of new blood, a lot of business guys, a lot of people that he knew from the States, a lot of, uh, a lot of people that were very friendly to him. Mm -hmm. And so what happens, what happens when you come into an island, basically – and I learned this lesson here in a small town in southern Indiana. Uh, I won't say the name of the town, Seymour, Indiana. And I went and I met with the Libertarian Party there, and we started talking a lot about the politics there. And because this small town was 40 minutes from any major road or interstate or anything, they were fairly secluded, but it was still a fairly decent-sized town. But it was just totally insular. And I don't think it was Seymour. I think it was some other town I'm thinking of. But it was down around that area. And this town just had some of the craziest problems I'd ever heard as executive director of the Libertarian Party of Indiana. And the reason was that there wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of movement. It was just the same people kind of have grown up to manage the town. And it was the, good old, it was the first experience that I had really had in Indiana with the old, old, good old boy network. Uh, that existed in Indiana before, you know, the 1980s, 90s kind of cleared out and, and new leadership came in uh, across the state. And that's kind of like Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico and, and some of these islands, you have an old guard. This is the way we do things. We're not going to be corrupted by America and, and how they do things. And, and it's very resistant to change. And so when Rosello came into Puerto Rico with his boys, Mm -hmm. as I'll call them, the and boys. started to do things a different way, they weren't receptive to listening to that old guard. Now, I've made this point about the Libertarian Party nationally. There are a lot of people like the Mises Caucus, and uh, you know, a couple years ago, two, three years ago, where I would say to Michael Heiss and the Mises Caucus, which was an upstart caucus, we're going to take over the party, we're going to reform it, and we're going to recruit people to go, and we're going to change it, and blah, 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 blah. I said, 
Michael, you don't understand that the people that make up the thousand voting delegates of the Libertarian Party, those people have been in the party 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Some of those people founded the party. And they're, they're a tight network of people, and they're just not going to hand over the reins to you if they don't feel that you're going to be responsible with what they have put in in terms of time, treasure. Like somebody like Joe Houtman, who has worked for the Libertarian Party cause for 45 years, is not just going to hand over the reins to some kid just because he says, I'm new, I'm fresh, I've got bold ideas. That's not how power works. People mm -hmm. don't give up power freely until they really, like, it, it takes a lot. It takes a, a massive outer pressure of new influx, or it takes people working within the system and making that old power comfortable with the new power. And the problem with Rosella and his boys is that they didn't sit down with those guys, and when they did, they didn't listen they didn't ask for advice. They didn't listen to advice. They just said, well, I'm president now. We're in charge of all these cabinet posts. And so they they just – they this happens all the time in politics. It's happening to the Indiana attorney general. He was just sort of brash and mm -hmm. didn't really want to, like, talk to the legislature and didn't think that he needed precinct committeemen and county chairmen. And he was the attorney general now, and there's nothing that any of them could do about it. And the second he got into trouble, they didn't help out. Yeah, and that's what happened to Rosello. Rosello got got too enamored with his own ability to be a charismatic new leader, to be the Kennedy of Puerto Rico, that he forgot to tend the garden of the old guard. And so when trouble came about, as it always does for a new and experienced politician, they weren't with him. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's why Donald Trump can do whatever he wants. There's an established power base within the Republican Party that will just support a Republican president because of their own self-interest, no matter what the president does or says. Mm -hmm. If it isn't clear to you that, that, that the party will do anything to protect itself, including supporting Donald Trump, it should be clear to you. And so that's kind of what happened. So this texting scandal where their group chat gets leaked mm -hmm. ends up completely hanging them. Uh, and so that's kind of the the overview of what happened here. Yeah. And Trump does like if you watch like Trump does go after the like does help out the old guard. It's like he gives them their, you know, their his the judges that they want. They get Trump goes after make sure like make sure the old guard of the Republican Party is happy. He also the good old boy network here in Indiana, in Indiana period. It's it's still around the it's it's. You know, the FBI has cleared out a lot of it, especially in Muncie. <laughs> right. They're constantly, and they're still trying. But it, it's one of those good old boy networks that, you know, they control a lot of different things. And if you, but the thing is, they've controlled so much that if you don't use them, there's not much left else. And I think that's a lot of the corruption thing he had is like with, with cut off from that network, he was forced to go through, find other means and other vendors. And that's also how he, you know, inexperiencedly just kind of like, kind of like stubbed his toe tripped you know made a trip yeah and he fell and tripped in the middle of a corruption scandal and in the middle of the fallout of maria which is still i mean obviously maria was super devastating to puerto rico and uh remains so yes and so on july 10th two former puerto rican officials the island's education secretary julia keller and the head of the health insurance administration angela avila marrero uh, were arrested on corruption charges. They were accused of directing millions of dollars in government contracts to politically connected contractors. Now, the next day, on July 11th, after the arrest, the governor returned home from a previously scheduled family vacation outside the U.S. territory, and a few messages from a private telegram chat with his inner circle were leaked. He apologized for referring to a former New York official with an ex expletive in those messages. Now, once we're done with kind of the timeline, we'll give you what some of the messages said. Now, on July 13th, uh, the Puerto Rican Center for Investigative Journalism published 900 pages of private messages. Now, imagine if there were 900 pages of your group chat. How devastating could you pick? You could pick that apart and make somebody look anyway. That's happened to us, actually. That happened to me. A former Wall co-host had screenshotted a bunch of group chats and then went into our group and tried to make me and several other people look really bad. And Mm -hmm. Fortunately, everybody's like, what's wrong with you? Um, so the exchanges from the messaging app Telegram ridiculed numerous politicians, journalists, and celebrities. They were sent from December 18 to January 19. So they were chit-chatting a lot in a month, uh, month span. 
Uh, now, two cabinet members who are part of the chat, Puerto Rico's former chief fiscal officer, Sobrina Vega, and Secretary of State Luis Riviera Marin, Marin resign. Now, I have a lot of trouble pronouncing names, especially of a foreign nature, so I greatly apologize. And, and, uh, Puerto, Rico, Puerto Rico isn't foreign. Uh, uh-huh. And so when I, got to, when I got to Montreal, there was this girl there, and she's like, uh, I was like, so what's your name? And she's like, Noir. I was like, noir? <laughs> noir. I said, noir? Noir. I said, no, nor, Nora? I go, listen, I go, listen, honey, my mouth don't make those noises. Uh, <laughs> another girl noir. named Camille. I go, Camille. I was like, well, I, you're Camille to me now. Um, so, <laughs> July 14th. The protests begin to grow outside Rosello's, uh, uh, his residence, and they call for his resignation. Now, on the 16th, he announced that he would not step down. I will continue my work and my responsibility to the people of Puerto Rico. Now, the 17th, just the Justice Department of Puerto Rico issues summonses for everyone involved in the private group chat. Uh, the 19th, the president of Puerto Rico's House of Representatives, Carlos Mendez, uh, Carlos Mencia, Created a special committee to advise him on whether the governor committed impeachable offenses based, based so they appointed Robert um, Mulero. That's a joke. Uh, Rosello announced he will not run for re-election in 2020 and resigned from his role as president of the new Progressive Party. Uh, so he he resigned on July 21st, days less than a week after the initial leak. Hundreds of thousands of people shut down a major highway in San Juan and launched an island-wide strike demanding Rosello's resignation. Uh, so he didn't resign from president of the country, just the president of the party, and said he wouldn't run for re-election. And that wasn't enough. And so the 23rd, his chief of staff, re staff resigned. And finally, on the 24th, Rosello announced he would resign effective August 2nd. Now, on July 28th, this is being recorded July 30th, uh, Puerto Rico's Secretary of Justice, Wanda Vasquez Garcet, said on Twitter she does not want to be the Puerto Rico's next governor. According to Puerto Rico's order of succession, the Secretary of State should be next in line after the governor. Uh, however, the man holding that position, Marin, resigned on July 13th. As a result, Vasquez was next in line. Uh, so we now have a crisis of who will uh, lead in Puerto Rico. Uh, so that is kind of where we're at in terms of the timeline. So what have what was in the messages? Uh, now we'll put in the show notes. You can look at uh, the uh, all 889 pages in our show notes if you'd like, but we'll just give you the highlights. In the protests began after uh, 11 men and Rosello were in a group chat, and that was leaked. They were often seen as offensive and sensitive, as well as showing a cozy relationship between Rosello and his former staff members who now represent special interests. The Washington Post said, all men, they make misogynistic jokes, makes fun of gay, it's basically saying, all men, they made misogynistic jokes, made fun of gay people, insulted journalists, joked about shooting San Juan's female mayor, made light of uh, Hurricane Maria victims, and joked about the weight of a citizen whom the governor had posed in a photo. From a New York Times piece, quote, what they found was shocking. Members of Mr. Rosello's inner circle boasted about unleashing trolls against their critics on social media. They exchanged one meme after another, mimicking President Trump, colossally divisive, a colossally divisive figure in Puerto Rico. The governor mocked a poverty-stricken woman who had torn down a photograph of him in a government office after being denied food stamps. There were texts about using the government's advertising budget to assert control over newspapers. Quote, there's no other way to describe it. It was an atomic bomb, uh, said Benjamin Torres Gote, a prominent Puerto Rican journalist, wrote in El Nuevo Dia. For the first time, he, sa he says, the country could see the ruling class without their masks on. Some of the subjects of the messages included uh, former New York City Council Speaker Melissa Mark v Vivitero. The initial leaked messages in Rosello first apologized for and saw him refer as her, uh, she as a, a, a whore. Uh, now, the governor wrote that he was upset that Mark Vivitero had criticized Tom Perez, chair of the DNC, for backing statehood of Puerto Rico. Rosello wrote, our people should come out and defend Tom and beat up that whore. 
uh, now uh, offer no further analysis there. San Juan, San Juan Mayor Carmen Yulin Cruz in the chat, the Chief Fiscal Officer Christian Sobriano Vega wrote, I am salivating to shoot her. And the president of Puerto Rico responded, you'd be doing me a grand favor. He also wrote that she must be, quote, off her meds by deciding to run against him. Puerto Rican singer Ricky Martin took a hit. Um, Vega wrote, nothing says patriarchal oppression like Ricky Martin. Ricky Martin is such a male chauvinist that he fucks men because women don't measure up. Pure patriarchy. I mean, oh, no. <laughs> right. You're supposed to be offended, Harry. That's, okay. I know that's a funny joke, but you're not allowed to laugh at that. That's horrible. That, yeah, that was horrible. Uh, yeah, and that's the thing about this is, like, we're reading you some of the excerpts, so you don't have the context of the conversation and what goes into a conversation. Are, are Now, obviously uh, – None of this is good, <laughs> um, but we'll give you some analysis here in just a moment. So a uh, shortage of, of uh, pathologists at a government forensic agency took a hit. They got the former chief. This guy, this guy must be the lens of the chat. He's really he's yeah. the Tad Western of the group. He's really going after people. He's the yeah, he's putting it out there. Yeah, I'm Go just like, shocked that we never brought up like, you know, like Indiana singers and in, like in the chat room, you know. Yeah, like uh, or or Adam Driver from Indiana, or, uh, Gary Native, mm -hmm. uh, the Jackson Five, um, <laughs> Vega, the chief former the former chief financial officer. In one chat, was asked about the budget for uh, for the forensic pathologist. He responded with a joke about the growing pile of dead bodies at the morgue after Maria. "Quote: Now that we are on the subject, don't we have some cadavers to feed on our crows?" He wrote in an apparent reference to government critics. Um, now. The, the is there more behind the anger and protest according to the new york times piece quote the protests are much more about than just the unseemly chat messages they amount to a rejection of decades of mismanagement management by leaders who always seemed to benefit while ordinary puerto ricans suffered grievances have been building up over 12 years of economic recession a debt crisis that has prompted layoffs and cutbacks in public services and the botched response to hurricane maria now, the chat messages and the arrest of last week of six people with ties to the Rosello government were the last straw for many Puerto Ricans who said they could no longer tolerate mocking, profanity, corruption, real or perceived by leaders who were supposed to be fighting on their behalf in Washington and San Juan. So pro protesters want to get rid of both Rosello and the unelected oversight board created by Congress to manage the finances of the island's government, which owes far more than it can pay to its creditors. Protesters have been chanting, Ricky renuncia y alleviate a la junta, which translates to Ricky resign and take the board with you. In many ways, the events that lead to the turnover of the Puerto Rican government began in June. Uh, Raul Malun, Malun, Maldonado Gautier, the secretary of the treasury and the former chief of staff to the governor, told a radio interview that there was an institutional mafia operating a profit-making business in his department. He said that some of them had threatened him and tried to extort him. Gautier was fired, and Eric Roland, Governor Rosello's deputy chief of staff, told reporters, we cannot allow people in the government who are not loyal to the governor or the central administration. Mm. That's rough. Yeah. Mr. Malodano's son uh, took to Facebook to denounce Governor Rosello as corrupt. In short order, the police showed up at his house, purportedly to investigate whether he had proper permits for a cache of firearms he owns. And his lawyers declared that a political war was underway. So it, it's very clear that this guy needs to go. He's clearly uh, a dangerous person with, with no good intentions and has absolutely nothing but disgust and distaste for the people that he governs. Right. And uh, you just can't have somebody like that with the – I mean, you can't really have anybody with the levers of power, but uh, you definitely don't want that guy to have it. Correct. And Puerto the Puerto Rico needs, you know, help, especially after Maria. The, that's why the federal government suspended the Jones Act so things could get there quickly, uh, quicker and faster and cheaper. Uh, but even when they got there, they realized, you know, everything else is it's not being managed properly. Uh, close to a billion dollars has been sent down to Puerto Rico. And um, yeah, it's still the same way that, you know, uh, New Orleans looked, you know, but these, most of the people stayed on this island instead of leaving like New Orleans, like most people did and, and when Katrina hit uh, New Orleans. Yeah. But, they, but I think, but they didn't even get, but New Orleans didn't even get close to the amount of money Puerto Rico got. No. No, Katrina's really 
a terrible tragedy, to be honest. I mean, it's right. yeah, it was terrible. You get happy. You don't, if, if you're younger and you've never looked into Katrina, you should. Yeah, it's de- devastated the town. It's still n- really not back to its former glory before Katrina. There, there's just not a lot of analysis here. Like, there's just no, there's no defending that. I mean, listen, there, there is the. I guess if you look at it in in terms of. There isn't anything that people say. Like you, you could take any chats that any of us are in, or anybody that's listening in, and everybody tries to outdo each other with jokes in, in a poor manner. But I can't imagine being a government official in the middle of Maria and making fun of like dead Puerto Ricans as they're laying. There. Like there just doesn't, to me. Like I get that their privacy was invaded and they were saying something different in private, but that's sort of the point. Like. I just don't see anything here worth defending. Like they have, to, this guy had to go. Mm-hmm. He's lost the consent of the governed, and it's their right to overturn it. I mean, it's right. It's just it's grotesque what they were saying, and there's just nothing. The, the argument that well, this was said in private, and they d- probably don't believe that. They were probably kidding. It's like when somebody's in charge of the force of government, can you really take that chance? Like you really want to take your chance? Like. This guy clearly, when somebody says something mean about him on Facebook, investigates his enemies. So Correct. He's yeah. Uh, he, individual. Correct. You don't want him to get more reign of power to do something else or find something else that he does. Like, let's say that he just decided to start sending the IRS or create a Puerto Rican IRS to send it people to arrest them. But yeah. It's- All right. So let's talk about Hong Kong. So th- that's like your Mickey Mouse corruption stuff. Um, it, like, like the that's that's all bad stuff right mm-hmm. now let's talk about authoritarianism uh the reason i wanted to really kind of look at hong kong is uh hong kong i mean i was in 97 they they were a british port essentially mm-hmm. and then in 1997 they were returned to china under a policy known as one country two systems which promised autonomy a high degree of autonomy from uh, the communist China mainland and Hong Kong. Now, even as a young freshman or sophomore in high school, I knew that was never going to work, <laughs> and it was only a matter of time. So I've always kind of kept my eye on Hong Kong to see how how would the authoritarian government of China begin to deal with uh, a place that was had a very high economic degree of freedom. And the reason there are protests happening in Hong Kong is that they're not dealing with it very well, Harry. Correct. Now, for the longest time, like, Hong Kong was like a model that the Chinese Communist Party used to basically dig itself out of the hole it was in. Right. Yeah, because, you know, they had tons of farms like that, and then Mao did what Mao did. It would put them into massive famine, didn't have any farm, no food, nothing. Shut them off. And now, you know, and... You know, barely in, even when we got close to the 80s and the 90s, they were just barely digging themselves out of that hole. So they're because so of Hong Kong and demonstrations. Yeah, because they as they try to maintain their freedom, which is very difficult to maintain your freedom, especially against China uh, or Americans. Uh, there are a bill. Uh, there, there's an anti extradition bill. Uh, there's an extradition bill going through Hong Kong, which is kind of the the tender. Uh, the match that lit this tender, I guess, is the way to say it. Now, under one country, two systems, Hong Kong has continued to thrive under free markets, independent courts, freewheeling press, open internet, and other features that distinguish it from mainland China. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, the autonomy guaranteed to Hong Kong under a mini, uh, basically what is a mini constitution known as the Basic Law, which expired, uh, which expires in 2047. Now, recently, however, China's ruling Communist Party under Xi Jinping, uh, who has effectively become a dictator of the country, like Vladimir Putin, has been trying to lessen Hong Kong's autonomy. Now, the basic law guarantees that the Chinese authorities cannot stifle dissent in Hong Kong with an iron fist, as they do across the mainland and in the autonomous regions of Tibet and Zhejiang. Now, this has forced the Chinese government to chip away at the independence of Hong Kong's institutions by other means. For example, this extradition bill. Independence is under threat in the eyes of many uh, of Hong Kongers. Ben Bland, a Hong Kong expert at the Lowy Lowy Institute in Australia, said, quote, 
In recent years, the Hong Kong government has disqualified elective lawmakers, banned activists from running for office, prohibited a political party, jailed pro-democracy leaders, expelled a senior foreign journalist, and looked the other way when Beijing kidnapped its adversaries in Hong Kong. So what is the extradition bill? Now, I want to go to our uh, – let me go here first. Let me kind of give you more details, and then I'll give you a little analysis. The bill would allow Hong Kong to detain and transfer people in wanted countries and territories with which it has no formal extradition agreements, including Taiwan and the Chinese mainland. Now, you may remember Edward Snowden immediately flew to Hong Kong mm-hmm. when when uh, he leaked things, and that's where he was stuck for a period of time before he got to Moscow. Uh, Carrie Lam, the Hong Kong's chief executive, which is kind of the head of the government there, uh, championed the bill in February in response to pleas from the parents of a young woman who was allegedly murdered by her boyfriend while the pair visited Taiwan. The boyfriend is on Hong Kong, which does not have an extradition agreement with Taiwan. So they have taken a sad story, a sob story, uh, twisted it to mean whatever they like it to mean, so that the regular Hong Kong uh, people will just go, you know, but it is for the children, and so maybe we ought to have this extradition bill so these poor grieving parents can uh, see justice for their daughter. And people go, I, want, I have an emotional connection to these crying parents. I better just give up my freedom, and people usually do. Now, critics contend that the law would allow virtually anyone in the city to be picked up and detained in mainland China, a country which judges most follow mu- – a country in which judges must follow the orders of the Communist Party. So in China, the Communist Party rules everything. Many believe that if the bill is passed, mainland Chinese officials would use it to demand the extradition for trial on the mainland, not just criminal, but also political activists. The extradition plan applies to 37 crimes, excluding political ones. However, critics fear that the legislation would essentially legalize the sort of abductions to the mainland, that have taken place in Hong Kong in recent years. It would also open a can of worms that could eventually lead to more crimes being included. Under the law, the chief executive would need to approve an extradition request before the warrant is issued. Uh, a Hong Kong court would also be empowered to check that there is a basis, basically. So uh, the Hong Kong government is here to protect your rights, Harry. Mm-hmm. And you'll see this as we continue on with this discussion. It's not that, uh, listen, Hong Kong's government doesn't want to be the bad guys. They're here to protect the rights of Hong Kong people, right? right? I mean, what's the nature of government? The nature of government, Harry, is to protect your natural rights, is it not? Correct. Protect, steal. Oh, sorry. Uh, right. Protect, you know, protect, you know, and investigate and, you know, be a, do judges of fairness. Yes. Now the, the, and they will investigate themselves. Right. They're, they're above board. They just want to protect you. Yeah, uh, they don't want to, but they're going to make sure that if you have an extradition request, th- don't worry, the government will make sure that the Chinese are not overreaching. Mm-hmm. Uh, pro Beijing lawmakers hold 43 of the 70 feet seats in the Hong Kong legislature, all but ensuring the bill will pass if came to a vote. Uh, so, and it also basically makes a subordinate status to the mainland. Hong Kong's uh, basically need to be at the teat means that local leaders are not going to reject an extradition request from the mainland superiors. Uh, business executives who fear they might someday be extradited themselves to uncertain fates in Chinese, China's opaque judicial system have been major critics to the bill. Now, in announcing the suspicion of suspension of the bill on June 16th, Terry Lam emphasizing that it was not being withdrawn outright as protesters are de- demanding. So she said, we're just going to suspend it. But she didn't withdraw it, which means it's officially dead. On July 9th, she said the bill is dead, but still refused to officially withdraw it. Lam said, I have almost immediately put a stop to the amendment exercise, but there are still lingering doubts about the government's sincerity or worries about the government will restart the process in the legislative council. So I reiterate here, there is no such plan. The bill is dead. Now, here's what I would say about this. This sounds a lot like the American founding. And shortly after John Adams successfully acquitted the Boston, uh, the, the soldiers in the Boston Massacre, a, men, a, a court of New England men in the middle of the Boston Massacre fever mm-hmm. acquitted the soldiers that killed Bostonians. And then shortly after that, 
King George said, no, 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 any soldier needs to be tried in England because they need a fair trial. And eventually all trials they were threatening to hold in, in England. And it wasn't, it wasn't fair because you weren't going to get a fair shake in England. You were going to get whatever the state wanted to give you. Right. And that's what's happening here. And I, I will also say that the – so I watched a documentary on Auschwitz. Now, I know Godwin's Law and all that, but this is the, this is the example that most people are familiar with. They're most um, familiar with Nazis. Auschwitz was not an internment camp for Jews. Auschwitz began as a political prison for Poles and uh, Germans that they wanted to get out of Germany and on political dissidents, uh, especially Polish dissidents. And so the majority of the people that were held at Auschwitz initially were political dissidents. And that is where a tyrannical government always starts. They always start with the people who are the dissidents. They always start to eat away at the people who can – the way that they rot out the inside of government is they remove the people who are criticizing the government. Correct. Pointing fingers. Right. Who get the people riled up. They get them out of the, out of their houses, away from their you know their things, and go, try to you know make some noise. In a communistic society, in an authoritarian dictatorship like Xi Jinping's China, Hong Kong is an existential threat to him because. The people that he keeps under his thumb can look at the free markets of Hong Kong and go, I don't have that freedom. Why not? And so he must get rid of the freedom of Hong Kong. And what better way to begin rotting their freedom than to begin rotting the freedom the way that King George tried with the Americans and the way that it always has tried with all authoritarian governments, mm -hmm. export and get rid of all political dissidents. Why do you think Germany in World War I – Germany basically – so they went – I think it was to Switzerland. That's where uh, Vladimir Lenin was being uh, is isolated to. He had been shipped out of the country by the Russians – by the Russian heir, um, Nicholas, Tsar Nicholas. And the Germans went and got him and sent him on a train and put him on a, on a guarded train through Germany so he couldn't escape the train and, and corrupt and pollute their society. He was basically a toxin that the Germans put into Russia so that Russia would eventually leave the war. Uh, he, was, he was exiled. And so this is what they always try to do. They always try to exile and execute anyone who is a dissident. And that's what they're going to do in Hong Kong. And so the protests there are massive because they understand the existential threat that this extradition bill is. They don't fall for the BS of the parents crying. They understand that this is the beginning of the end of our freedom if we don't fight now, Harry. Right, and that's why I would like the um, the parallels to, to the American Revolution because these are um, just like them. The, these people have, you know, they had the ability to own not land because not much land in Hong Kong. I think it's really expensive, but own stuff. They have stuff. Their family owns stuff. It's not just be. You can't just get rich in Hong Kong just because you're just politically connected. Right. You know, you, you can work hard and then you can also leave and easily go places and have people come visit you. You can't do that in most of mainland China. You just don't even have the resources for that, and when you watch these protests and you watch how they don't back down and they watch their people who are supposed to represent them, they just kind of just like, it, you know, not ignore them, but just show them like we, they, they show that they won't be ignored. They're, 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 their they're, leaders they're, are on the side of Beijing. There's right. no doubt about it. They, right. they are losing quickly. The chaos is about to descend on Hong Kong because the people there recognize their freedom is being taken away. And the scoundrels that are in charge of the Hong Kong government are responsible. Right. Yeah. It's, and it is, I don't know. It's weird to watch it because it is like every, like it, one is the, the, the complete igno ignoring out of most of the media. They're not even talking about it. When you go to most things, it's not even on anyone's radar. A lot of the protests were happening, especially ones where the police put up signs that said, Hey, back down. We'll have to open fire, you know, get right. And they did it. The police did just back down. Like, no, we're just gonna let them in. Yeah. Well, Hong, the Carrie Lam is basically saying to China, no, 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 we got it. You don't need to send in Chinese troops. But the, the Chinese army 
has bases in Hong Kong and Beijing keeps threatening to release the People's Army into the streets of Hong Kong if they can't get it under control. And the leaders in Hong Kong know exactly how that's going to look. And so they're desperately trying to avoid that. Uh, so a little bit about the protest. They uh, first happened on March 31st with an attendance of 12,000 pro-democracy protesters. Police peaked the figure at 5,200. Uh, the movement gained stronger momentum after a second demonstration on April 28th with an estimator. Uh, the police estimated 22,000 people. Organizers claimed 130,000. A uh, protest was held on June 9th, and it was attended by 24,000 or 240,000 people, according to the police, or 1 million, according to the organizers. Now, on June 12th, protests outside the government headquarters escalated to violent clashes with police. 22 were injured. Multiple rounds of tear gas and rubber bullets were fired at protesters uh, from police and riot gear. Pablo Wong, a freelance journalist based in Hong Kong, was at the protest for over nine hours. He told USA Today... The perseverance of the mostly youthful crowd, who he said were protesting, was unprecedented in Hong Kong, and 81 people were injured in the violence. Now, why did the protest continue? Because Lam suspended it, but didn't, did not officially withdraw the bill. Lawmakers could still bring it back and act upon it before the end of the year, something protesters fear will happen. Quote, she is trying to delay and hope the Hong Kong people forget, said one protester. Uh, as protests have continued, opponents of the bill have had their concerns grow. Uh, many argue the police have, only, have been overly violent in their response, and, another, and other claims the death of a protester has not been properly addressed by the government. On July 21st, protests broke out, the seventh in a series of demonstrations that have taken place there every weekend since early June to make citizens' displeasure with Carrie Lam known, to, uh, known about and to call for an investigation into police actions at the protest. Um, while the extradition bill died in early June, demonstrators have continued to, as a platform for citizens to push back against what they call police brutality. Lamb's dismissal of the protesters uh, as rioters or stubborn children uh, has just only worsened things there. Beijing's growing influence in the city's politics is also, also making things more uh, chaotic. Violence escalated on the 21st as unknown assailants wearing white attacked the protesters, injuring at least eight people. The affiliation of the group of attackers in white is unknown, but some suspect they have ties to Beijing. So basically China is shipping in their own Antifa to make the protesters look bad. Uh, thousands continued to protest on July 27th and 28th, and on both eight days they fired the police fired tear gas and fired rubber bullets. Um, so the protests there have become violent, uh, and I don't blame them because they're in the fight for their life. And I think those of us here in America need to watch that and to understand what they're fighting for and to recognize that you have to be mobilized to fight for your liberty. You have to fight for your freedom. There is an actual cost to it, and sometimes that may even mean – revolutionary action but not but these these protesters are doing it in a nonviolent way and that's incredibly important nonviolent protest works violent protest do not because it always turns everybody against them so we wish the best of luck to those in hong kong who are fighting for liberty and uh it's it's a tall order so i, I don't know how they're going to do it but hopefully they can yeah it, it is I, I, there's a lot of hope for it because it, I think like the worst thing that could happen is to watch the People's Republic of China army to march in the street. It yeah. is, it, what, what that will do is that will galvanize the public. The, the public, I would think, would go, holy shit, this is not good. Like, this is Taiwan. This is like, what, what, what I think the Hong Kong officials there know is that the second you get Tiananmen Square, Tiananmen Square had a major, major impact on uh, those leaked photos, basically. The man who took the Tiananmen Square, he was up in his hotel room, and he got the photographs, and he, he saw he got spotted. And so he took his film, and he hid it in the toilet. And if somebody And they tore his room apart looking for that footage of the man, the tank man, in Tiananmen Square. And if they had flushed the toilet, they would have killed that photograph. But that photograph was then unleashed. And, and it really led to a lot of reforms in China. People saw what their government was doing. 
And if you put R- Red Army troops mm. on the streets of, of Hong Kong, a, a very free and independent nation, essentially, it's going to be... It's going to be bad for Beijing, which is already a very fragile government, it, it, which is why they're clamping down. Correct. And then, then the aspect of the social pressure, because it would become – China is a massive economic power because it exports a whole bunch of things to the United States. And, resp- and if, the, if pressure were all put on United States businesses, yes, this stuff was cheap, but you, you empowered this. So they would force, you know, companies around the world to, oh, well, we can't do business with you. Why? We we saw what you did to your people. You're worse than any other dictator that we've hated over the past. So well, your money's no good here. We we won't do money with you. We won't. We can't. We cannot do business with you. Which, which is like, yeah, this overturn thing. But that, and I'll take the 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 gas out of the you know out of the the people's army. But the thing is, how many people will starve to death before they actually let go of the reins of power then? We we find we we, do, we there's a history of trying to like nope they will starve them all to death if they have no other way they, they they've done it before and yeah. it's sad like this is different but like is it is it that much different right. they've only gotten out of it because they allow special economic zones in certain areas and collect money for them without those zones they're right back where they are right all right Harry well we're just about to wrap up we're we're going to do a little bit uh, of a shorter episode and then I may um, come back here uh, later in the week and do a second episode. Uh, I'll let you know if I'm going to do it. If you can join me, if not, I'll do it solo. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to try and make these episodes more manageable for people. So when, when people go and look at the feed, they go, Oh, Holy shit. Two hours. Uh, so we we're, we're trying to make sure that we're not scaring people off with the, with the links, but still giving you good quality information. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. I try this once a year, and then within two, what, two weeks, Harry, I'm ba- right back to three-hour episodes. Back to the three, three-hour episode, and then the power 10-hour, well, you know, the clocks right. are wrong. Right. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's August now, basically, and August is always tweak month here at Wall. Harry will tell you that I lay dormant for a brief period of time, and then August Just in a like, couple <laughs> August and May, it's like, will you stop sending me email, Spangle? <laughs> just like let's try this do this let's do this too i'm like okay all right let's do this fine yeah so i want to come back and i want to uh, well i'll come back later this week and i'll talk about boris johnson and i'll recap some of my thoughts on the debates and stuff i'll actually watch them and and kind of see where i think things are going so uh but for now i want to say thank you to our patrons you guys really you pay the bills here we greatly appreciate it you guys are uh, total minches we want to thank intern ed Bree hob uh, our only intern ever here on the show, uh, a new Patreon member, Jeff Bennett at a hundred dollars. Uh, so thanks so much to him for joining up. Jason Doolittle, Jason Doolittle, Jason Doolittle. Uh, thanks so much for always being such a great supporter of the show, the libertarian coalition. If you've not joined their Facebook page and Facebook group, please go and join the libertarian coalition. Uh, they do a great job of supporting us and, uh, you know, Donald, helped um, supply the, uh, the cover art for the brand new wall reader. So if you love printed materials, if you love, uh, we have a new intellectual journal. Whoever knew that we are libertarians would have an intellectual journal. Uh, it's certainly nothing I have anything to do with, but there are very smart people who are working on it. And you can get that on Amazon. So just go in and put in WAL reader. Uh, we're, uh, issue two is about immigration. And uh, our great friends at the Libertarian Coalition supply the uh, cover art for that. We've got Ryan Lindsay and Hody Johns and Renzo Martinez and several, several others writing in that and giving you every angle uh, on immigration from a libertarian perspective. There's for, there's against. It's, it's not just what I think. It's what a group of people, it's what we do here at We Are Libertarians, try to give you a broad view of things. Christy Avery, the lovely Christy Avery, we love her so much, and Craig DaCosta. The lovely Craig DaCosta. We love him, too. Uh, So thank you to those guys. Thank you to everybody who's in our Patreon. You guys pay the bills around here. Uh, We're about to make a bunch of upgrades. I'd really like to get some new graphic design and kind of redo all the logos. And we're going to redo the store. And I've got a bunch of ideas that I'm going to be working on and trying to fit into my schedule as as I have some dormant time from some of my other projects that, man, it started in January, Harry. 
Like, I just realized I've been grinding for eight months now. I, I just realized literally in the second, like, uh, it's just been since January that I've been, like, doing all these other projects. <laughs> and I just looked down. I'm like, it's August. That's eight months. No wonder you're tired. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, a lot going on here at We Are Libertarians behind the scenes that's going to translate to what you see in the public very soon. And so we're working on some of that stuff as well as continuing this great program. We've got several new shows uh, that will be added to the website soon, but are in all your podcatchers. Uh, Libertarian policy and politics. That is where we're moving wall daily. That is going to, to basically take the place of wall daily. We're moving those shows over to libertarian politics and policy. Uh, Ginger Arkey with our great friend, Trisha. Stuart, she is hosting interviews with a lot of people from an anarchist perspective, and she's uh, lovely and delightful and hilarious. Uh, so go check that out. Libertarian Debates, we are going to move the debates over to that feed and hopefully start to do debates more uh, on a broader subject, not just with candidates, but more, you know, uh, a debate on immigration and, and uh, for or against, right? Um, and so those are the new feeds, along with the, our other great shows like Boss Hog of Liberty and... Uh, Brian Nichols, the How Could I Forget Brian Nichols, uh, Raw Audio Politics. And so check out all of our podcasts over at wearelibertarians.com, and uh, you can get the feeds for all that stuff. So, Harry, thank you so much for joining me. Anyth- let's give the final sign-off. Anything that there's that you'd like to cover, the floor is yours. <laughs> oh, man, I didn't think I was going to do this. But uh, the one thing I do really recommend for people is to – really keep an eye out on um on the situation that's going in hong kong that to me with the stories we're talking about tonight that those that's the one to really like what it, it yes puerto rico that happened in the u.s state and that and it's interesting to watch watch that power struggle but that's you know it's not as interesting the, the 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 one going on in hong kong is going to be worth the watch yeah i think it's a it's a hugely important fight for liberty that, you know, like a hundred years ago, you'd be reading about this going, wow, they really fought their ass off for liberty. So I, I just think it's like it's one of those points in time where you wouldn't normally like see something in your lifetime like this. So, yeah, please take please tune in and make sure that you pay attention to it now that you kind of understand what it is. Right. Yeah, that's all good. All right, man. Well, thanks so much for joining us here on We Are Libertarians. We love all of you, and we will talk to you uh, further here in just a couple days. Um, you know, tr- tr- I'm not gonna try. I'm not gonna kill myself with two shows a week. We'll, we'll figure it out. I just want to make sure that. Listen, here's what it is. I've got a lot going on, but my first love is We're Libertarians, and I want to make sure that this audience gets everything that they have always gotten and expected, and you know, maybe tighten it up a little bit in certain areas. But at the end of the day, give you the same irreverent commentary on politics that you've always uh, expected from us and uh, the fun that you've always expected from us. So so make sure that you follow us uh, and continue to tell your friends about the program as we move into 2020. So with that, we will say au revoir, and I'll talk to you in a couple days. I picked that up in in, uh, French Canada, Harry. Au revoir. Au revoir. Bonjour. Salut. (laughs) All right. We'll talk to you later. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs>